For some dorky reason, I wanted to start the video with me like cracking open this bottle of bubbly. So I opened it <laughs> and I hadn't pressed play yet. So I wanted to capture that like sound because it's one of the best sounds in the world and I, I just missed it. So this is just, this, so this just has the dumbest opening of all time. Hey everybody, my name is Rick and because I'm gonna be doing a lot of individual book reviews on the channel this summer because of my 20 books of summer project, more info on that. Uh, in the box below. So I decided to do a tag today to kind of shake things up early on. Also, I haven't done a tag in a little while, so I thought, A, why not do one, and B, why not make one up? So I'm calling this the in or out book tag, and what I'm going to do is kind of rifle through common themes or tropes we find in literature all the time and say whether I am in on them or whether I am out on them. Basically, do I like something or do I not like something? It's super simple. If you want to do the tag yourself, I'm going to put all the prompts uh, in the box below, or if you want to come up with your own prompts, go for it. This is all made up. Okay, so the first prompt is reading the last page first. I am way, way, way out on this one. I recently discovered my friend Jess reads the last page before she reads the rest of the book because she wants to know if it has a good ending, whatever that means. I think that's psychotic. I think that is just like the weirdest way to start an experience with a book. Like I get where someone is coming from, but what if you spoil something just so massive? Knowing the ending is like a likable ending in whatever way you consider to be likable is so not worth to me the risk of just ruining the whole story in some way. Enemies to lovers. You know what, I'm gonna be out on this one. Enemies turned lovers, how do I say this? <laughs> how do I say this? I'm trying, okay, I'm tr I, was, I was trying to answer this question without bringing up The Rise of Skywalker, which people almost universally don't like, and that's fair. Uh, and people really hate at the end of that movie how Kylo Ren, or Ben Skywalker, dies. Just when he's redeemed, he dies at the end. And people hate it because they want him to be able to kind of be forgiven, for his past sins and then go on and atone by being a good person again. But what I think people are missing in that scenario is the fact that Ben chooses to die himself and that just as he's brought back to the light, he realizes, I think, this is all internal, this is, this is what I'm projecting onto him, by the way, this doesn't actually, it's not spoken in the, in the film. But I think Ben realizes that he's done some awful, like he's responsible for the deaths of millions of people. And while someone else can forgive him for having done that, he can't forgive himself for having done that. And he chooses to sacrifice himself to save Rey. And I think that's a huge part of the like, villain coming back from the dark side or the evil side, whatever you wanna call it, that's usually ignored in these enemies to lovers kind of scenarios. like coming to terms with all the bad shit that the evil person did. And I think there, there, it's one thing for the good person to forgive. It's another for the, the evil person to forgive themselves for what they have done. So I'm not saying that the uh, enemies to lovers is inherently bad. I'm saying that my personal opinion is that it's interesting if, if they can't actually close that gap. Dream sequences, out. Fuck off forever, dream se- Get out of here, dream sequences. Now that's a little unfair. I don't hate all dream sequences, but I feel like 95% of them, it's just the author trying to do something interesting or like, or the dream sequence is so much more interesting to the person writing it than it is to the person reading it. I just think for the most part, they're a total misfire. There are so few of them I've ever read that I was like, I'm glad that happened. I'm glad they put that in there. Love triangles. I am going to be in on love triangles, I think. I think they can often be really, really bad and weirdly shallow and also very manufactured. I think love triangles are something that are just, they're very hot right now. So authors and publishers want to introduce love triangles because people get very passionate about it as fans. So it can be just god awful, but I think when it works really well, it works really, really well. Like there's a reason it's a trope. There's a reason it's a device that's lasted so long. So I'm gonna answer this one optimistically and say that I'm in for love triangles. Cracked spines. I want to say I'm in, but I'm probably out on this one. I forget who brought it up a couple of years ago, but I think it was an author that was just saying like, they love someone coming up to them with their book and it's just they beat the shit out of it. Like the corners are all bent and the spine is super cracked and they've written on inside and it just looks like it's, 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 it's 
been put through its paces. And the author was like, that is like the biggest compliment to that author because that person clearly took that book with them everywhere. And I thought that was so endearing and I would love to be one of those people for that reason. But I just like, yeah, sadly, I think maybe pathetically just have all my books in just almost pristine condition in a way that looks like I don't even read them. And that's the part that kind of makes me a little sad. I wish I was a person whose books looked well read because <laughs> they are. And I just, I wish they reflected that. The back to my small town trope. I am way, way, just way in on this one. I love the story of people kind of being from small towns, moving away to the city, and then something brings them back and they have to kind of grapple with their own history, grapple with this small town that they came out of. I might be biased because that is exactly my story, but I, I love it. I love the friction that can happen between the city and a town. I love the growth that can happen from the city to the town. I wish there was a little more, because here's, here's the part about this trope that I don't like. It's always done in terms of someone from a small town going to a city, coming back to the small town and realizing what they had all along. I wish that wasn't always the answer. It can be beautiful to be done that way, but Sometimes I, th I would like to read a story where someone's coming from a city to a small town and it's like, no, this place is awful for this reason, this reason, and this, like, there's a lot of negative small town thinking that people do not like to put in literature. Small towns are inherently more conservative, more racist, I think more kind of inherently less interesting because they're more resistant to change. There's a lot of stuff about small towns that isn't bright and cheery and it's not that good, and no one wants to talk about it. So I wish there were some of those stories written as well, but that doesn't change the fact that I do love the coming back home and discovering something about your small town that you actually value. Monsters are regular people just like us. I am out. I could see the value of this trope for a while, hitting kind of vampires and werewolves and all these kinds of things and showing them that, you know, they can be kids just like us and they can have all the, the wants and dreams that we have, everyone's different except everyone as a metaphor for inclusion and diversity kind of thing, which is, which is nice to a degree, but I think it's, it's past its point. And to me, I think I just prefer, or at least right now, prefer the metaphor of monsters being able to show us something about ourselves and how we are monsters. It's like the famous line from Community where Jeff is criticizing Twilight and he says, people fail to grasp the central insipid metaphor of those movies, that men are monsters who crave young flesh. To me, that is a much more interesting symbolic trope. No paragraph breaks in a novel. I am out, 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 I, <laughs> I hate this so much. And this isn't just like, this isn't Duck's Newberry Port shaming. Uh, I hated it long before Duck's Newberry Port, but that kind of pushed me over the edge. I'm reading a book right now, Dead Souls by Sam Riviere. A much better book, in my opinion, than Duck's Newberry Port, but it also doesn't have paragraph breaks. And even in a book that I'm enjoying, the no paragraph break thing, I'm just like, why, why, why are you, do why, why are you gonna make this experience harder on a reader than you have to? I just, I don't get it. Multi-generational sagas. And I think this is gonna make people mad because I am out. When this is done really well, I can enjoy it, but for the most part, I really don't like stories that jump around through generations of time. I, I, I much prefer, if it's up to me, to stick with one group of characters and follow them through it, to be like, I'm following this main character and then we're gonna jump 100 years in the future and their great-great-granddaughter is, is pulling at some kind of plot thread in the future and then you get to see the influence of one on the other. And it's, it's like, it all sounds so much more interesting to me as jacket copy than it does when I'm actually reading the story. I find it really frustrating to jump between like generations of people most of the time. A couple of my favorite novels ever are, are, are multi-generational books. Um, so when it's done really well, I can enjoy it. But if I'm gonna say one or the other, I'm gonna say no. Rereading, I am way in, way, way, way in. People who don't reread books, I'm just like, there's the argument of like, there's so many thousands of books you're gonna to wanna to read, why would you spend any time rereading one you've already read? Yeah, but you didn't get everything out of that book that you loved. Why wouldn't you read it again and get more out of it rather than take the chance on something that you very, 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 very likely will enjoy less? Like. 
I'm a huge proponent of going deeper rather than wider. Ideally, you can get both. That's what I like to try to do with my reading. But when I can go deeper, I will go deeper. And I can't believe I'm making this hand gesture as I'm saying that. The exploration of artificial intelligence. And I'm going to be way in on this one. Um, there's very few artificial intelligence stories that kind of try to explore the human condition that I don't find really, really interesting. I just love them. Drop caps at the start of chapters. I'm way in on this one. That's like screams fairy tales. It screams kind of old literature. It screams something that's kind of classy, but also kind of whimsical. Love it. Happy endings. Um, it's one of those things that's totally subjective because what is a happy ending? It's gonna be different for each reader. I am going to say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna say in on them because I do believe in them. I think happy endings are important for the right story. I think defaulting to happy endings is terrible, but I wouldn't be someone who's like, I hate a happy ending. I'd never wanna have it. I, I wouldn't go that far, so I'll be in. Multiple plot points that only converge at the very end of the story can go fuck themselves. I can't stand this in books at all. No matter how interesting both sides of that story are, this is the way my brain works. I'm just so concentrated on being like, when are they going to actually meet? When are these two stories gonna converge? How is one related to the other one? And it's just, it's so distracting to me. Even if objectively it's done really well and it actually is better for the story, I just, my brain, I'm, I'm too focused on it and I can't enjoy the actual story itself. I fucking hate it. Detailed magic systems. This might annoy people, but I am out. This is like the thing in fantasy these days that for some reason people seem to think makes a good fantasy book. That, like there's an internal logical consistency to everything and you can see it all. And I get in theory why that's interesting. But to me, the more detailed a magic system is, the less magical it seems. To me, there needs to be mystery to magic. Here's the way I like to think of it. I want the author to know exactly how the magic system works but they don't need to tell me absolutely everything. This way, when it's used, it will stick to the internal consistency that the author has made, but they don't need to explain every single step to me along the way for me to get it. Classic Tolkien-esque fantasy races. I am way in on these. So I'm talking like humans, elves, dwarves, gnomes, halflings, these sorts of things, these kind of classic fantasy races. I love them. It doesn't seem kind of in fashion to use these things anymore. I wish there was more high quality fantasy that used them. I think the interaction between them all is really interesting. I do like when you can subvert them a little bit. I don't like them being the same all the time, but I do kind of generally love what each one is about. And it just screams to a lot of the books that I loved as a kid. And I feel like some of that stuff has been lost over time as kind of grim dark fantasy has come in and fantasy books trying to be kind of more and more and more realistic all the time. I, I feel like some of this stuff has been lost and I miss it. Unreliable narrators. I am in. I think for me, learning to enjoy unreliable narrators has been kind of a journey of maturity for me as a reader. When I was younger, I really hated unreliable narrators because for some reason I just wasn't aware of them being unreliable. I feel like I could only enjoy it if, if something in the story really pointed to the fact that like this person is unreliable, pay attention to that. For, maybe I just wasn't looking for it or was just like was too naive going into a story. I just believed everything a character said so that when it, it finally kind of turned out that, that they were unreliable the entire time, I would just kind of feel betrayed and stupid or whatever. But I feel like now that I'm older, I see the unreliableness much earlier in the story so that I can enjoy the story knowing this person is unreliable and I don't need it like pointed out to me. I think this is a long-winded way of me saying I'm stupid. <laughs> Evil protagonists. Ah, uh, oh, this is gonna be a complicated one. I'm gonna say in, but with a caveat. The version of this that I like is when you think you're cheering for the hero the entire time and they turn out to be the villain. I think that's really fun. Cheering for somebody or, or, or kind of being forced to maybe pull for someone who is clearly the evil person in the story. I don't understand. I don't really get some people's fascination with, with evil. It's like people who play video games where you can be good or bad and choose to do the bad stuff. I just like, I don't get that. I think there's something like this, this is maybe sounds so weenie of me, but like there's something about that seems inherently troubling to me. Like people who like 
desire to go and do evil shit, is that just them wishing they could do that in real life and they know they can't, so then they live that out through a game? I don't know. So it's kind of like that where I'm like, are you enjoying this character because you secretly want to do some of these? Th I don't know. I feel like this is a really bad answer. It's just that that's just how I feel. The Chosen One character. Um... <laughs> um... This is one I think I could go either way. I've loved a lot of Chosen One stories. I'm gonna just say for the meantime, I am out because I'm really obsessed these days with the idea of someone not being the chosen one who thinks they are the chosen one. I think that's such an interesting story structure. So that kind of relies on the idea of a chosen one being the thing, but it turns out that it's not actually true or they weren't the chosen one all along. So yeah, maybe I don't know how to answer this question. I'm, I'm gonna say I'm out, but I, I, it could go either way. I don't know. When the protagonist dies, I'm gonna be in on that one. I think it's actually really interesting when the protagonist of the story dies like middle of the way through. I think that's like, that can be kind of cool. Um, I don't know, I just like, if you, yeah, if you never want the protagonist to die, it just, that just inherently makes things less risky, less interesting to me. Um, kill your darlings is something I truly believe in, in any creative work that you're doing. You have to be willing to let things go, even if you love them. I think that's like a good practice just to have in life. So I'm gonna lump this in to that as well. Really long chapters. Uh, I am out on really long chapters. I kind of don't see the point of it. I feel like it's something that's putting a pressure on certain readers that doesn't need to be there. I feel like there's no real downside to having shorter chapters. Even for people who don't mind long chapters, they can deal with having shorter chapters. Whereas someone who prefers shorter chapters will find it grating to read through a long chapter. So I feel like it, yeah, it's just, Having long chapters, you can only piss people off. French flaps, I'm way in. It's probably my favorite physical aspect of a book you can have is French flaps. Deckled edges, this is gonna bother people. I'm in on deckled edges. I, I don't need them, but the vitriol some people have for deckled edges on books is like the funniest thing in the world. Like, like that is the nerdiest, weirdest thing about modern book culture to me. Like some people just like, I out will not want to buy a book because it has deckled edges. I just, I, I feel like physically it doesn't like make it that much more difficult to turn a page. I don't know, I don't get it. And just to make some of you mad, I'm gonna be in on this one. Signed copies by the author. I am out. This seems like something that might be a weird stance to take. I just like, I don't care. Like celebrity in general is something i try and not care about as much as possible like the signature of an author i don't i don't know i just don't really i don't care like having a personal message to me that part of it's kind that's kind of nice but it's usually just such a canned phrase if it comes out of some kind of conversation we're having at a signing table and then they mention a detail that is very specific to me that that could be super cool but if it's just like Thanks for being a fan, Stephen King. Like who ca Who cares? Dog earing pages. Sorry people, I'm okay with it. I do it with every couple of books that I read. I try to be kind of subtle with it and just do a little, little kind of turn down to the corner. I'm not one of these kind of big like, pff, this massive fold and, and it's just gonna kind of wreck that page forever. But yeah, I don't see the harm in, in having kind of little dog ears and then coming back to them later. I don't think it's a big deal at all. And finally, chapter titles as opposed to numbers. In? This is another one I don't really have a particularly strong opinion on. In retrospect, I don't know why I'm asking myself questions for things that I don't really have an opinion on. This is like, clearly I just got a list of all these things <laughs> and I didn't spend a lot of time vetting them. So there you go, that was my in and out book tag. If you wanna play along, like I said, you can use the prompts that I used. I'm gonna put them in the description box below. If you wanna come up with a completely new list and still call it the in and out book tag, go nuts. As always, thanks so much for watching. My name is Rick McDonnell and I'll see you guys in a couple days. Bye.